Okay, I didn't do this last week um, because I wanted to continue in John and coordinate some things together. Um, we've been putting a lot of work in John, and we're going to, and I want you to really have a comprehension of the book. Um, this time I want to look at something that's connected with John in terms of a feast day. And uh, the question is this, is that my Bible in an Easter basket? Okay. Acts chapter 12, Acts chapter 12, Acts chapter 12. Now, you guys wouldn't know it, probably most of you, and you're better off. <laughs> but uh, when people try to point out mistakes in the King James, they say this is one of them. 28 times in your, war, in, in your Bible, the word Pasha okay, is translated Passover. 29 times you see the word Pasha in your Bible. And you would say, well, then 29 times it'd be translated Passover. But there's one exception, and that's in Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Okay. Where it's translated Easter. So folks say it's a mistranslation of the word Pasha. Okay. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at that and... Here's the thing I always learn about people pointing out mistakes in your Bible, is you learn something <laughs> every time you learn something. You know, I look at it as a effort by the adversary in th that is um, saying there's mistakes in your Bible and translation issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, textual criticism going at it. You know, man trying to correct what God says, not understanding the big issues. And there's always something to learn because it's an in, it, they're doing something interesting here. Do you remember how we studied uh, John chapter 10? What did we find? We're looking at the book of John, three Passovers. And God will provide himself a Passover. God himself will provide, God will provide himself a sacrifice, right? And that's how we're looking at the book of John. First we looked at the eight miracles. Now we're looking at it from that angle. And here we have the word Passover. Okay, and it's in the context of Herod, one of the Herods. There's eight of them in your New Testament. Okay, um, if you look at those eight Herods, you remember the first one, Herod the Great. What did he do? Killed all the children that were under two years old. You remember that? Okay, this is Herod Agrippa the first. Okay, there are six Herods in front of him. But in Acts chapter 12, we read in verse 1, Now, about the time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex. What's that mean? Trouble. Trouble. Who? Certain of the church. He's going to take leaders of the church, and he wants to trouble them. How? By killing them. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And he actually saw the Jewish leaders get all stirred up about it, but not negatively, positively. So what's he do next? And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded, uh, proceeded, verse 3, to take Peter also. So he kills James, and now he's got Peter. And it says, Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to the four quaternions, Quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. We're in Acts chapter 12, verse 1 through 4. So we're going to look at that translation of Easter there. I told you, there are 29 times you find the word Pasha translated to Passover, except for this one exception, you find the word Pasha translated into the word Easter. Okay? And folks say, well, that's a mistranslation in the King James. Uh, notice what we did last time. We looked at a feast that's not a feast. It wasn't given by God. Remember what that was? Feast of Dedication. And it had to do with the 400 silent years and Julian Maccabees. Um, remember all that? And because they retook the temple back from the Greeks in like 164 uh, BC. And so then there was a rededication 
feast set up by Israel with no revelation from God in between Malachi and Matthew, 400 silent years. What do they call that in the Catholic Bible? They have books that were written. The Apocrypha, right? So anywho, we saw that 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 thing was done in winter, that Feast of Dedication. And guess where it was right around when they did it? Right around the winter solstice. And what date is that for us in this culture? Feast of Dedication matches up with Christmas. Guess what? The origin of Hanukkah, I was talking with Jill about this, comes from Feast of Dedication. And you go, why did the Lord go to that? He was saying to these apostates, what? Rededicate this temple. They were rededicating the temple historically from that period when it was taken back from the Greeks. And so the Lord suddenly appears, stands up, said, rededicate this temple. He's the temple. And that's why the Lord was there. Now, Passover, Easter, are they the same thing? No, they are not. They are not the same thing. Uh, we're going to look at it a little bit here. Look at Acts chapter 12. I'm, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And look at verse 12. Verse 12. Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token, a sign, upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. There's the origin of the word, right? The angel of death passed over them. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So Passover is that very night. It's a memorial of that night where death passed over the firstborn of Israel and establishes Israel's freedom from their bondage in Egypt that night. That breaks the back of Egypt and the Pharaoh. That last plague, the eighth one, there were seven plagues that come before it. Easter, what's Easter? Well, Easter's source is a pagan festival, and it has to do with Ashtart, or known as Ishtar. And pronounce, see those two words? What, can, what could you easily get from those two? That, that queen of heaven, that terminology? Ishtar, Easter, see that? That's where it comes from. You, know, you transliterate you Easter. Um, the festival was always held late in the month of March. Um, and it's a celebration of the earth in its original form regenerating itself after winter. It's a celebration of reproduction, regeneration. Hence, Playboy magazine, what's their symbol? What, what do rabbits have? A rapid what? Reproductive rate. Ashtart in your Bible is a female deity known as the Queen of Heaven. Now, this is where this comes from. There's really no question about it. It's very obvious. Take a look at Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. This is old. This is old. Okay, it's old. Apostasy, you know, Gentile paganism. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 7, and you find it in the Canaanites who were in the land. When Israel came into the land, these were the gods that the Canaanites worshipped. 
and one was the queen of heaven. Uh, take a look at Jeremiah 7, look at verse 18. The children gather wood and the fathers kindle fire and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Look at chapter 44, chapter 44, chapter 44. So the question is, does Israel get involved with the gods of the Canaanites? In this case, the queen of heaven. Queen of Heaven's a big deal in your Bible. Uh, what's the Queen of Heaven's current form? Mary, the Virgin Mary, right? Uh, Jeremiah 44, look at verse 17. Verse 17. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of your own mouth, to burn incense unto the Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done. We and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, for then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. Now I can keep reading on here. Um, it goes on and on. Uh, verse 19, And when we burned incense to the Queen of Heaven, poured out drink offerings... Um, let's see, then Jeremiah said unto all the people, to the men and to the women and to all the people which had given him that answer, saying, The incense that ye burn in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings and your princes and the people of the Lamb, did not the Lord remember them and came it not to his mind? So the Lord could no longer bear because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which ye have committed. Therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant as at this day because ye have burned incense and because ye have sinned against the Lord uh, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord nor walked in the law nor in his statutes nor in his testimonies. Therefore this evil has happened unto you as at this day. Moreover, Jeremiah said unto, unto all the people and to the women, Hear the word of the Lord, all, all Judah that are in the land of Egypt. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and, and fulfilled with your hands, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. Now here's the thing about this too. Here we have the Queen of Heaven and we have water being poured out. Uh, in John, what's the Lord say to them at, at Tabernacles? We're going to see that when we study uh, John. He says, out of, his, out of his belly shall flow what? Living water. A type of what? God the Holy Spirit. And you see they're pouring these drink offerings, you know, etc. You know, this mimicry of the one God, the true God. Um, Look at Ezekiel 8.14. Look at Ezekiel 8.14. We could go on for quite a while. We're not going to. Ezekiel 8.14. Ezekiel 8.14. Verse 13 says, He said unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. We're talking about the abominations of Israel before their captivity. What's Jeremiah called the weeping prophet? Why? He foretells of Israel's what? Being wretched out of the land for their abominations. These are these abominations. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and beheld. There sat women weeping at Tammuz. That, that's the husband of Ishtar, Easter. And they're weeping because of him. Uh, I'm looking for a verse here. I thought it was that one. Verse 16, And he brought me unto the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, a door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And they worshiped the sun toward the east. I neglected to put that verse down. 
So here we are. We got, you know what we got with these guys, these priests? And priests of Israel. An early morning service they're having. An early morning, we say now, Sunday service. I don't know how many times people said, hey, we're having an early morning Easter service at sunrise. <laughs> what is that thing? What is that from? That idea. You've heard that, right? An early morning Easter sunrise service. Who are they worshiping here? Who are the priests worshiping when they're facing towards the east? Queen of Heaven and their husband. You see the origin of that Easter service in the morning? That the church is... I mean, you'd think that you'd think the church in this country were a bunch of Canaanites, wouldn't you? Much less apostate Israel. Um, the Gentiles identify Easter this way, and it's solar related. Um, the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. It's not the same day Easter on the calendar, is it? Why? Because it has to do with the moon. It's the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. The sun's at the center of that thing, right? Of that date. What's the vernal equinox? Well, it's when night and day are of equal length. I know in this country we change the times all around, you know, you know so the kids don't get killed at the bus stops, I guess. I don't know. But, you know, baloney. It's confusing, isn't it? There's places in this country where they won't acknowledge federal standard time. Um, oh, this is a bunch of politicians, you know, saying, I can change the date. <laughs> it's, yeah, sure. <laughs> Supposedly. You know, it's about power is what it is. And I'll show you, that, that's history with that. Um, it's when the sun's elliptic in our latitude, on our, it, when the sun is closest to the horizon. If you were to step back, all that stuff out there, including the sun is going like this, 23 degrees above the equator, 23 degrees below the equator. When the sun's at the equator, they call it the vernal equinox, perpendicular to our equator. Okay, um, here's the thing. That, that thing that we call Easter, based on that dating method, is based on the Julian, or they call it the Gregorian calendar. Well, who would that be? Well, it's named after Pope Gregory VIII in 1582. What did the Pope do? I'm going to do it different. Your day, right, change the calendar. Change the calendar. See that? You've got to be a pretty powerful guy to change the calendar, don't you? And what we have is with the year beginning 10 days after the winter solstice, December 21st, with the elliptic over the equator. It's a solar calendar, okay, with the direct light of the sun. The Jews, however, are on a lunar calendar. And the feast days are based on new moons. Okay. Um, you think about the, the moon. What's the difference between the moon as one of the brightest in our, in our, in, when we look into the firmament, what's the brightest? The sun. What's the second brightest? Less, the lesser light. The moon. It's reflective light. That's what God would have Israel do. What? Reflect the light of God the sun amongst the nations. Um, the Jews' Passover was based on an event, and we talked about it in Exodus chapter 12. Their firstborn were delivered, weren't they, from the angel of death. Um, and it transpiring, when the firstborn, both of man and beast, were smitten in the land of Egypt, an event that took place on the month when? Look at Exodus 9.31. Exodus 9.31. Exodus 9.31. That happened at a certain period of time in terms of the harvest. And it was the harvest of flax and barley. Notice it says, verse 31, And the flax and the barley was smitten. 
For the barley was in the ear, and the flax was bullied. Who knows what that means? Bullied. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pod. It, it, you, first, you've got barley. When the barley's ready to be harvested, what do you got? A seed head, right, on the barley. The flax, what you have is a bowl. The word bowling, it's a bowl. It's a pod, right? And you open up the pod, and what do you get? The seed that, you know, like milkweed, like milkweed flax. And it's saying, that's the time, Israel, that... Take a look at um, Exodus 13.4. Exodus 13.4. This day came ye out of Egypt in the month of Abib. Abib. It was later called Nisan, but originally Abib. And notice when you go back to Exodus chapter 12, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. Not like that the, uh, Gregory the Eighth, that Pope that said ten days after the winter solstice is the beginning of the year, but the beginning of Israel's calendar year is this month and correlates with April and sometimes into March. Um, actually, it doesn't. It, Easter does, <laughs> depending on the full moon, the next full moon. Uh, notice, um, it was to be the first month of Israel's calendar year, the beginning of months. And we already said it's based on a lunar calendar, and new moons are where the feasts are, time, are, 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 are set. Now, Here's the question. Can, we know the Jewish Passover is April 14th. Easter is later in the same month. Can we know that Herod was referring to Easter in Acts chapter 12, 4 and not the Jewish Passover? Because those that say it's a mistranslation say he's referring to the Jewish Passover. If he's referring to the Jewish Passover, the translation of Pasha, Pasha as Easter is incorrect. Okay? Go to Acts chapter 12 again. Acts chapter 12 again. Notice verse 3. Notice verse 3. And because he saw it please the Jew, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of what? When he took Peter, what, what was the time frame with Israel's calendar year? Well, it doesn't say Passover there. What does it say? Days of... It doesn't even say feast. It says days of unleavened bread. What would you suppose when you read that? Passover is already past. And we're now not the feast of unleavened bread, but the days of unleavened bread. Passover passed. That day, the 14th, came and went. Um, take a look at Exodus 12 again. Exodus 12 again. So in the first, the beginning of months, are April, okay, the beginning of months. On the 14th day of the month, look at Exodus 12, 14. Uh, go, uh, forget that, take a look at... Um, Verse 3 of Exodus 12, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him, his, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to the eating shall make your count for the lamb. We're talking about the firstborn of a family, right? So he's talking about how... Where, how many does one Passover lamb feed, right, according to family? Because we have to protect what with the blood of the lamb? The firstborn of the household. It says, verse 5, Your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day 
of the same month, four days later. So what are you doing for 10 days? You're watching it. You've got it penned up. And the whole of, in the whole, and, and it's visible, okay? That's the one that's going to be the Passover lamb. You know, think about the book of John here, okay? And the Lord Jesus Christ being the Passover lamb and what these shadows foretell of the, of the true Passover lamb. And it says, And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper post of the house, wherein thou shalt eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in the night, roast with fire. Typology. You're going to barbecue the pig. You're not going to boil it in water. Okay? You're not going to boil it in water. Um, sec, what, what is that a picture of? Not just the first death, but what? The Lord suffered what? Our death in the lake of fire, a burnt offering, completely consumed. Notice. And they shall eat the flesh in the night, roast with fire unle and unleavened bread. So they eat unleavened bread the first. If you add Passover to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you get eight days. Because the Feast of Unleavened Bread is seven days. But you're eating unleavened bread on Passover. You see that? And bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, so not raw, not sodden with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. All of it. Burnt offering. Isn't that what the deal with the burnt offering? Completely consume the sacrifice. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until morning, and that which remaineth of it unto the morning ye shall what? How do you dispose of it? Burn that too. Isn't that what happened on the cross of Calvary with the Lord Jesus Christ? Was he completely soul and spirit consumed by God's cup of wrath on him for our sins? All of them. And that's what you read here. Um, so the first month, April, the 14th day, at even, a Jewish day started with uh, night, 12 hours, and then the day, 12 hours. So we, you ended your day with light. We don't think that way, do we? How do we end our day? Dark. It's darkness. We end our day with darkness. The Lord ended his day with, there's something to teach there, see, light. We're in the darkness, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb, comes in, and he's the light of the world. Remember the day star in Peter? He talks about the Lord Jesus Christ, the day star in his second advent. All stuff fits together. Don't think it doesn't. Okay? The integrity of the Bible is what wins you to trusting in it and not let the wisdom of this world challenge it. And don't think, like my son said to me, he was asking a question, he goes, why did God say it that way? As if God made a mistake and we need to straighten it out, see? That's how I thought when I was a younger Christian. That's how everybody thinks. Until they understand the integrity of every word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. There's no capricious word. When we write, do we have capricious, you know, too many notes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're not the Lord. And our words aren't life when they're spoken. Um, so, the first month, the 14th day at even, 6 p.m., they ate unleavened bread till the 21st, seven days. Okay, now, the Feast of Passover is just one of the three high holy days every Israelite was to keep, whether it be local, whether it be in the area of Judea, or whether they be distant. They were all to pilgrimage for these three high holy hosts. In Exodus 23, we won't turn there, 14 through 17, here's the three. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Harvest. The Feast of, the, the feast of Ingathering. And you go, which ones are those? Well, those are just names for what you're more familiar with from Leviticus 23. The Feast of Unleavened Bread included the 14th, the Passover. 
The Feast of Harvest, that's the Feast of Weeks, or we call it Pentecost. The Feast of Ingathering, that's the last feast. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, I want you to notice something. Uh, we already did, so I'll just refer to it. In Acts 12, 8, they're to eat the Passover lamb with what kind of bread? Unleavened. And then seven days following, what do they eat? Unleavened bread. Take a look at Matthew 26, 17. Matthew 26, 17. I'll show you this because folks that are trying to teach this that I know don't generally. And I, I don't want to have you get confused by this if someone were to throw it at you. And I don't know that any of you pursue this kind of thing, okay? But I want to teach with it. Uh, you know what I'm saying, be, are even exposed to it. How many of you talk to people that say, well, you know, the King James Bible has the translation of Posh as Easter in Acts chapter 12, and that's a mistranslation. Ooh, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> right? Matthew 26, 17. Matthew 26, 17. Now, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him, this is, the, this is the third Passover. Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house. He had to have a house, right? With a, with a lamb. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now what do you notice there? The Feast of Unleavened Bread, is it also called the Passover? Let's put it this way. They say, it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And yet it's the 14th, the Passover hasn't occurred, right? It's even's going to come and they're going to eat the Passover lamb, right? Right? You follow me? So what do we know? The Feast of Unleavened Bread can be called the what? The Passover. Take a look at Luke 22.1 if that's not... Clear enough. Luke 22, 1. In other words, the disciples are saying it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the 14th hasn't happened yet. The 14th of Abib. On the 10th, they take the lamb. On the 14th day, they eat Passover, and they refer to that 14th day as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Luke 22, verse 1. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, which is called the... See that? That's an equal sign. Synonymous. Well, what did, what's common with the two? With, with Passover and unleavened bread, what's, what's the commonality? Unleavened bread. Uh, what's, what's, what's leaven in bread? What's that mean in your Bible? That'd be sin. Paul, make, Paul, Paul you know, by divine uh, a commentary, Paul says that has to do with sin. A little leaven leaveneth your the whole lump. And you put a little leaven in the bread, it'll rise. And leaven is a, is a reference to sin. And you think, what is that about? Well, knowledge does what? Puffeth up. <laughs> and now what the bread does, it puffs up. And puffing up, is that good in the Christian life? No. It's maybe good in a puffer fish, but not in you. That would be the flesh. That would be a fruit of the flesh. Um, now, go back to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. What do we got here? I want you to notice something here. So Herod kills James, and he takes Peter, and notice it says, it's not the Feast of Unleavened Bread there. What does it say? It's the Days of Unleavened Bread. Days, plural, that's a reference to seven, right? You had Passover, that's eight. And... When he had apprehended him, he put him to prison and delivered him to the quaternions of the soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So what's he going to wait to transpire? Now just think about this. If he's waiting for Easter to transpire and we're in the days of unleavened bread, whether you want to call the days of unleavened bread starting on the 14th because you know, the Feast of the Passover is called Passover or not, he's waiting the 14th is going to go by. And the 14th isn't coming up again until next year. Do you see that? Do you see my point? That is not a reference to the Jews' Passover. 
the pagan ritual of Easter, having your Sunday morning sunrise service facing to the east, is not the Jews' Passover. So it says he took him in the days of unleavened bread, and then he's going to wait. The 14th goes by. Oh, do you see that in the passages? Okay. Herod, a pagan Roman who worshipped the Queen of Heaven, had no reason to keep the Jews' Passover. Here's what some say. Herod was going to wait until the Jews' Passover, that high day, was over. And because and, he was afraid the Jews would get mad if he killed Peter on the Passover. And that supports a mistranslation of the word Pasha, right, to Easter. As if Easter and pa Passover were the same thing. And it's a mistranslation because it should say Passover there. He's going to wait till Passover was over. Passover is Passover's already over. This is something new. That's all I want to show you with this. The t they call it lexiconically. As you look through the context here, you can see that Easter is not a reference to Passover in the passages. He was not worried about upsetting the Jews by killing Peter on the, their Passover. Okay? Because um, Herod, if you look, look at Mark 14.1, Mark 14.1, he didn't care about that. That's evident in his history and the history of the Herods, okay? They don't care about that. Look at Mark 14.1. After two days was the Feast of Passover and of unleavened bread. You see that right there? And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. So are, are the Jews concerned about killing somebody on the Passover, on the high feast? No. They're not. Herod's not. The Jews aren't. Um, look at Acts 9.2. Acts 9.2. Acts 9.2. Herod is not waiting for Passover to transpire in order that he can kill Peter. Passover has transpired. He doesn't care about the Jews' holidays, holy days, whether they be high, low, or whatever. And the funny part is, neither do the Jews when it came to the Lord Jesus Christ or his disciples. Acts chapter 9, verse... Is that what I want? Yeah. Yeah? No. You know what, I'll skip going to these passages for time's sake. I'm looking at how much I got in the time. Um, Peter's not even considered a Jew by the chief priests. Um, he, to them, had repudiated Judaism by being a follower of Messiah in the little flock. Herod's not afraid of the Jews by killing a man on a religious holiday. Herod had no respect for the Jews' religious holidays, as the scriptures show. Um, it's it's, it's uh, Passover, and you know what Herod's doing? In Acts chapter 12, or you see in Matthew chapter 14, for example, Herod's famous killing during his birthday celebration of who? On his birthday, who did he kill? John the Baptist, exactly. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ, they kill him on Passover. You have any problem with that? The Romans? That's Herod's Roman. Herod Agrippa I is a Roman. Um, so that whole idea that Herod's afraid of, you know, the, the Jews' religious holidays is ridiculous. Now, here's the conclusion. Easter is the biblical record of a pagan celebration that has nothing to do with the church, the body of Christ, it's an assimilation, and it has nothing to do with the Feast of Passover. It's an assimilation of the Roman church as it sought to Christianize paganism. Okay? Uh, look at Colossians 2.16. Where are we at? 
Now, how do you figure this out? Because it says, then were the days of unleavened bread. All we're trying to determine is the, 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 the translation Easter there is a proper translation and a reference to this pagan orgy okay, that Herod was so looking forward to that he didn't want to have to deal with that issue until afterwards he killed one, put a little time in between and killed the other. He didn't care about the Jews' holidays. He cared about his holidays, his birthday. See, this pagan festival... Colossians 2.16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or the Sabbath days. I mean, when Easter, it just swang by last weekend. Did everybody get all reverent and everything? Do you got to do a certain thing? Do you put the eggs around the house and go look for them? Right? Do you have to preach about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? No, people are thinking that, so teach what it really, as far as calendar, when it really happened. Okay. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. We're not to give respect to, notice we call them holidays. What's that come from? Holy days. We're not to give respect to those. Why? Those are shadows of things to come. That's Israel's program. They're the ones that are respecter of days, right? The church, the body of Christ, we don't respect the days. Every day, the more doctrine you assimilate, the more able you are to drop the respect that you had for holy days and embrace every day as the same. We're to rejoice in the Lord today and every day following. We're not to have special days. My whole life when I was a kid was special days. Isn't that how it works? Easter. Ooh, candy. <laughs> I saw this AT&T commercial. And they got the kids sitting. Have you seen those commercials with the kids sitting around the table? And uh, what is, what's the question he asked about, you know, the candy thing? He said something about where would you want to live. And they, one girl says, well, I'd like to live in an island of candy. Yeah, where the sand's sugar. And the water's, uh, uh, um, yeah, soda. And what the, this one kid goes, what would be the animals made out of? And then the, the adult sitting at the table, he goes, I'm assuming candy. <laughs> I'm assuming candy. You know, all these festivals, and that's like Herod, he's looking forward to something, the decadence of the thing, right? I mean, he has a birthday party, and for his, his uh, what was that? Niece, was it? She wants John, the head of John the Baptist on a platter, and he does it. <coughs> you know, Christmas. You're sitting in bed, and what are, what are you dying to do? You can't even sleep because you want to get up and go downstairs and look and see what's under that bell pole, don't you? You know that has the star on the top because you worship angels, Queen of Heaven. You don't see all that. I remember my dad saying to me when I said, you know, the Lord's Prayer is not, the prayer I've been reciting my whole life, is not for us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I said, that's written to the Jews. The Jews asked him how to pray. And he said, pray for the kingdom to come. Right? And my dad said, I vehemently disagree with you. And I go, okay. And I said something about Christmas. And he goes, I explain what Christmas is. You can go to Jeremiah 10. There's a Christmas tree. How old is this thing? Right? I mean, described. The Christmas tree in Jeremiah 10 is described. You cut a, a tree that has a straight pole, right? Evergreens. You deck it with silver and gold. You nail it to a board. I mean, come on. This is old. Old stuff. And my dad goes, well, I don't look at it that way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Aren't those the answers you get? What do you need in order to not respect holidays? And I, I wouldn't have done that now. I wouldn't have done the same things I did when I was a young Turk, you know, believer, and I was learning things. And I was so excited about them and found out not everybody was. <laughs> what, 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 uh, what was my question? So we can quit. What, what was it? It's important. You get the doctrine, and the doctrine causes you to let go. And know that every day counts for him, for service to him, and the joy of doing it. 
And we're not a people that gives respect to that. Does it take doctrine to learn that? Did it take doctrine for you to learn it? I remember somebody in a church that I went to showed an older man, Jeremiah chapter 10. You might want to look, write that down and look at the first six verses. And I remember he showed it to this older man, and the older man saw it, and the guy said, that's a Christmas tree. And the older man says, I got a Christmas tree in the front yard. I got a Christmas tree in the living room. I got a Christmas tree in the basement. And they're staying right where they are. So did it help to show that guy that passage? What does he need? Well, he needs to understand who the church, the body of Christ is, right? And that stuff doesn't even come from Israel. That stuff comes from where? The adversary. <laughs> okay? Yeah, and I was going to read it. Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Those holy... Do Notice it says, I'll read 16, and we'll stop. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, what you're eating. Did they have dietary restrictions, the Jews? Uh, Gil came over for, for, for... My mom was cooking a dinner on Easter Sunday there, and we were having pig. <laughs> now, is that what you would eat if you were Jewish? <laughs> well, there you go. It depends, right? These, there is no Jew today. But here he goes. He says, there's the meat. Or in drink. Or in respect of a holy day or new moon. See the new moons? Feasts. Or of Sabbath days. That weekly Sabbath. Right? New moon, that's a reference to feasts. See all that? And then the word, then it says, which are shadows of things to come. Isn't that what the Passover is? A shadow of God will provide himself a sacrifice. But, changing condition, the body is of who? It's another agency of blessing that replaced the former one. Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We pray that we would learn to trust in the words that we have between front and back cover of a Bible today that's not hard to identify as your word. It, it simply takes a study of your word to see it and have it taught clearly and plainly. Um, and that we can clearly see the power and might of your word to the enlightening of our eyes and our soul. In the Lord Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.